Coming um, to the last session before the plenary here. Um, so this is a roundtable decolonization at the margins um, is what we have called it. Um, this is being recorded for the Society for French Historical Studies. Um, so just know that. Um, and uh, so my name is Jack Anamical. I teach at Duke University. Um, I'm in a program called International Comparative Studies and History and Gender Feminist Sexuality Studies. Um, I'm going to sort of act as moderator. We have um, some pre-circulated questions that we all were thinking about. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on how this panel came together, um, uh, Sarah uh, Griswold and I, who will introduce her in a second, um, got, uh, got to talking sort of what it, about what it meant to do research in French history that is often thought of as very marginal to the field, both geographically um, and often temporally and all kinds of other, theoretically, and all, ki all kinds of other registers. Um, so we thought it'd be really interesting to put together a round table um, to talk, to talk about uh, these sort of thorny questions and what it really means for the field of French history, um, what it me means um, for our own work to be sort of on the margins, um, whether that's, that's like a, a position that can be theoretically rich or not. Um, so that's what this, this round table is about today. Um, so um, we're gonna start by just, everyone's gonna introduce themselves and then we'll um, give some remarks on some of the questions that we've been thinking about. So as I said, um, I'm Jack and Amical. It's, um, it's written Jessica <laughs> in a lot of places, but I go by Jekka. Um, I work on uh, the history of decolonization in French India. I have a book called Unsettling Utopia, which is <laughs> sitting up here, if anyone wants to see it, um, which is about French India. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and so I will turn it over to Sarah. Yeah, um, so thanks, Jekka. So I'm Sarah Griswold, and I'm a uh, at Oklahoma State and assistant professor. Um, I work on um, the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon and specifically um, the uh, role of archaeologists and um, the service of antiquities. Um, I'm working on the period from 1918 to 1948, and I'm excited to, I think some of you in the audience know about the French mandate because of me, because <laughs> it's all I talk about. <laughs> um, but I'm happy, I want to expand the conversation. I'm so excited to be up here with um, three other people who do too. Yeah. Awesome. Hey everybody, I'm Sarah Miles. I'm a PhD candidate at UNC Chapel Hill um, and I work on radical leftist publications in France, Quebec, and Algeria. Well, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> um, in like the 1960s to the 1980s. Um, so in particular, I sort of look at intellectual transmission between these publications and thinking about how communication between these spaces is shaping how the left is thinking about things like the role of the intellectual, the meaning of decolonization, and some of these other kind of big concepts of third worldism in the 60s. Um, I'm also very excited to be talking about this. For most of our conversation today, I'm going to put on my Quebec hat because Algeria is obviously not really a marginal place when we're talking about decolonization. Um, so so I will be mostly talking about it sort of from that angle. Uh, hi, I'm Sung Choi. I teach at a uh, business study school that still respects the place of gen ed in history. It's called Bentley University outside of Boston in a town called Waltham. Um, and my specialization is decolonization in Algeria, but somehow I was led down the archival track to and, and fell upon Madagascar. So that's where I am in terms of the quote-unquote periphery for today, and we're looking at decolonization from the margins. So I'll be talking about my current article project on French sociologists who are engaged in development schemes in Madagascar in the 1960s. Great, thank you everyone. Um, so I, I also just want to um, encourage everyone in the audience if you have questions or things you want to talk about please do jot them down because we will we're going to try to make this interactive as we go along um, so we'd love to hear your own experiences with your own work or even thinking about things that sort of just don't appear um, normally uh, when we're doing french studies or french history um, so we'd, we'd want to um, really try to expand the conversation like that so um, i'm just going to say something about the questions that we wrote before turning it over to song um, so sarah and i put together some 
different questions. Um, you know, it's it's the periphery, the question about the periphery and the metropole is not a new question, right? It's a question we've been thinking about for a long time. The question of how we center um, states and national archives and things like this, again, is not a new question. But somehow it's something that like we, it doesn't seem like we've overcome these things at all. And while we might have intentions um, to move past these things, um, you know, institutionally, it's very difficult. Um, just um, having access to resources can make it very difficult to be doing these sort of transnational global projects. But then also just finding a way to make it speak to people who are, you know, interested in the hexagon <laughs> can also be really challenging. So we put together some questions um, to think about it. Questions like, how, do you, how did you come to your research project? How do you conceive of your work as part of the project of French history? Are there tensions between the regional fields or subfields that you work in? Um, and then also there's just this question about decolonization, right? Like what is it um, both as a theoretical, um, as, as, a, as a theory and, a, and as an event, right? Um, and as an ongoing project. How does this fit into our conversations? You know, some of this originates as, for me, a person who works on this process of decolonization, in India, people weren't calling for decolonization um, in 1947, they were calling for the end of empire. Like, this wasn't a term they used, right? But this term originates with the French in the 19th century. Um, in relationship to Algeria. So when we start to sort of think about it as the time goes on in the 1950s, the register sort of changes. Um, so, um, so we're thinking about sort of what decolonization means in that sense. So that is what has uh, shaped our responses for today. Um, so I'm going to uh, send it over to Song to get us started on thinking about these questions. Thank you. So uh, there were supposed to be a couple more people on the panel, <laughs> but since there's fewer of us, I think we'll have a lot more room to discuss these things so I'm really eager to hear from the audience as well and I tend to speak softly so if you can't hear me please raise your hand and I'll raise the volume of my voice so as I said um, I'm originally not an expert at all on Madagascar I was in the archives because after my first book on repatriating the Pianois and the Archi from Algeria I wanted to start a project on cooperation and cooperant who worked in um, post-colonial states. But um, none of that really spoke to me until one day I opened a box and out tumbled a report by a research institute uh, called IRAM, and I'll introduce it in a second here, but they were a group of development sociologists of social Catholic background, and they went to Senegal, Morocco, and Madagascar in that order. Madagascar turned out to be the most challenging place. So I'm looking at why this particular place gave them so much trouble in terms of their project. So I'll start with a sort of opening uh, of the kind of problematic and framing of how I enter into the story. So we all remember Eric Jennings' book, uh, Vichy in the Tropics, where he names Syria, Saint-Pierre et Miquelon, and Madagascar as sites of intense imperial competition between Pétain and the Anglo-Gaullist alliance during the first years of Vichy. And the point he was making there was that, in fact, these weren't the most prominent territories in the metropolitan imaginary for empire, but during the Vichy period, they became incredibly central to Vichy authorities because the war had globalized and dispersed Europe's zones of imperial competition and those locations were further and further away removed from uh, the metropolitan mainland and the Mediterranean. So between 1940 and 42, uh, remote from metropole loca locales were precisely where Patin's uh, nationalist revolution ended up imposing its most intense policies. So he already made the argument that far-flung places often expose the most brute nature of Vichy as we know it. But we're here to talk about peripheries in general, quote unquote, and why they matter in talking about not Vichy but decolonization, which is a global movement. 
but obviously as historians, although we study globalizing events and phenomena, we're still very much constrained by geographical fixity when it comes to the archives, when it comes to the actual events, places, peoples, and times we're studying. We often find ourselves boxed in, um, <laughs> looking at how globalization gets localized and what that looks like on the ground in uh, niche locations. So although it can be limiting, in my case, uh, when I studied the archives for this project in Madagascar, the Madagascan case opened up a huge question of what it means to modernize during the period of decolonization. So it also allowed me to decenter decolonization itself, to cast my view beyond North Africa and move away from the cases where Iram actually, this institute actually found themselves gaining success and track, uh, a good traction, which was in Senegal and Morocco. So once they leave those locales and come to Madagascar, they face a whole slew of different challenges. Um, Madagascar is a very complex place, as everyone who's read about it knows. It had a huge uprising against the French between 1947 and 1949, and it is known to uh, be the place where the French exercised the most brute oppression against anti-colonial uprising. Mm -hmm. It's a very diverse uh, climatically, uh, geographically, ethnically, linguistically. Um, so all of these things make for studying Madagascar are very challenging, not just uh, for non-experts, but experts as well. I corresponded with um, a couple of people who have written extensively on Madagascar, and when they told me what doing archival work was like actually on the island, uh, it was very intimidating, made me feel very lucky that I was doing uh, archival work, in, even in Fontainebleau. <laughs> so, um, during the 1950s, Madagascar already had become the center of attention for the United Nations and uh, for the French technocrats who were interested in um, modernizing and in implementing uh, development schemes uh, in the island. So um, when the Iram, this group of sociologists, arrive, it's 1962, they feel they've gained some confidence from having already been in Senegal, in Mamadou uh, Doudia's cabinet, uh, helping development operations. In Morocco, they uh, went to help with dismantling the bidonville and um, kind of looking at new housing schemes and irrigation schemes. So from that, they thought they could apply those methods directly uh, to Madagascar. <coughs> A little bit about the institute itself, it's still functioning, uh, but right now it's a NGO organization. We have Amelia Lyons in the audience who also works on this institute. And I first introduced them as a group of sociologists with a social Catholic background. And that's quite important because at this time, after World War II, the social Catholics a lot of them uh, become sociologists, but with a particular emphasis on something called the social enquête. And this goes back uh, even before World War II, uh, stemming from the interwar period. But the social enquête is something um, they believed had to be very detailed reports and investigations of people in their surrounding, in the organic relationship they had with the terrain. And they thought that method was uh, a counterpoint to the technocratic method ongoing by the United Nations and the Anglophone development um, schemes which sort of from their perspective transposed a very uniform model and these sociologists believe that the social enquête method uh, which would uh, sort of look very scrutinize the kind of connections that peasants had to the land and their daily lives on the land that they would be respectful of the conditions that were local so this was their um, method and um, I'm just going to give you a sense of 
what their investigation looked like, what are the questions they asked the peasants in terms of raising, their goal was to raise the consciousness of the peasants and to quote unquote animate them um, and kind of get them to get interested in their own uh, voluntary way of prog progress, achieving economic progress, that this wouldn't be something delivered from the exterior, but that once they were trained and educated on the importance of economic progress, that they would then take this on themselves. So um, first do the investigation on the ground, looking at them in the context, daily context, and then through animation, train them, and then after that, hopefully, that uh, they would see the peasants themselves taking on the project long term. So this was in the end wishful thinking because um, the Madagascans were not at all interested in this project. So only a tier of them were and actually at this time the post-independence government was interested except that Madagascar's terrain was still very much disconnected from the central government. A lot of the villages were very remote um, from Antananarivo and they were still functioning as barter economies and uh, were in a state that many French administrators, even at the time of the colonial empire, were not able to really alter. And perhaps that was not even their intention. So I, what I'm going to do is read you a transcript of the dialogue between the sociologist and the peasants. And then I'm going to sort of um, give my spin on what I think is going on in this conversation. So the sociologist is already frustrated that the peasants have no interest in becoming animated or becoming animators. Um, they would rather live on the sustainable uh, barter system rather than produce for the market. They weren't interested in raising, cultivating cash crops. So here he, the sociologist arrives and is now ready to tackle, <coughs> tackle this obstacle with them. So he asks, um, if I were to say to you that and you are not very friendly to animation, um, you know, I want to first understand what you understand by being animated or animation or animator, animateur, animation, um, what do you understand by that? And the peasant responds, I speak the truth. It's you who should explain to me what you mean first and then I will respond. Okay, so the sociologist says, if I say to you that to be animated means technically to be the opposite of being dead, what would you say? The peasant responds, I would say you're right, and I'm entirely in agreement. So the sociologist says, so you mean this whole village that has not been animated, you are dead? And the peasant says, right now, I am dead. No one here is animating me. I am not animated, therefore I am dead. So the sociologist is now confused. <laughs> um, undeterred, he asks, our conversation seems to be turning on riddles, but let's speak seriously. How did your village end up then selecting animators? Because they were asked, each village was asked to select animators. Um, we didn't select animators, this is the response. Um, they chose themselves, they volunteered, because nobody else wanted to be animators. So why did you not volunteer? Because I don't want to be responsible for something I know nothing about. So then the sociologist is even more frustrated and actually um, the peasant now starts to uh, challenge the sociologist because all of the animators who were selected um, mainly because the elders of the village ended up just designating the youth because no one else wanted to do it and the youth generally listened to the elders. So they went for 15 days of training. So he, now the peasant complains that 15 days is no near sufficient for training someone to come back to the village and help them farm. So the sociologist understood that and he asks, you mean to say that 15 days of training was insufficient? So the peasant responds, let me ask you something. How many days have you worked to become the professor that you are? I think it was more than 15 days. And now I learned that you also are continuing your studies. And I'm sure you had access to books. When you do not know something, you have resources. 
And he continues on to challenge the fact that they were not given enough time to uh, learn how to farm these things. And when they did follow instructions and farm the cash crops, they didn't have roads to take these to market, so they all rotted. So um, here the sociologist w is now realizing the utter talking past uh, with these peasants. And uh, he understands that their scheme is not at all successful and will not achieve the goals by the end of the season. This is a very long document. It's about uh, 180 pages. A lot of the dialogue is rich in this kind of conversation. But when I read other anthropological works uh, done in Cameroon, for example, similar dialogues happen uh, between people who are the objects of development schemes and uh, anthropologists or sociologists who are on the ground doing this kind of work. So um, what does Madagascar and these kind of conversations tell us? Unlike Senegal, where there was an administrative structure, there was more communication between local villages and the central administration. Um, there was a more a densely populated cities that could take on this kind of work of development. In Madagascar, none of that existed. The infrastructure was almost non-existent. So, um, but still this modernization effort was being implemented with incredible investment of finances and resources put into uh, this work. So what, what are we supposed to extrapolate from this, right? This is the question. It tells us a lot about the failure of modernization. And interestingly, it's not because the peasants resisted modernization. Um, in my view, that's not what's going on. In fact, because they want more training, they want more equipment, they want to take on the resources and control it themselves. So it's a question of who gets control of what is really, uh, the, the ensuing dialogue really shows this tension between the French wanting to control the resources and the peasants themselves wanting to have the village control it from the French. So I um, am starting to question the basis of what we uh, think about when we think of modernization. Is it the West and post-colonial operations forcing things on people uh, who don't want this or is it something else and I think the latter that that it people do want things to change people did want uh, certain things especially farming and for raising productivity in their villages but they wanted to do it their way so I guess in some ways it's resistance but not completely rejecting the idea of modernization of course they didn't use the concept of modernization. The peasants did not use that. Um, I thought of incorporating James Scott as, um, you know, he's old school, but he still has a lot to tell us about the way uh, dialogue works. And he calls this the hidden transcript in the art of resistance. And it's a mode of being for people who are introduced to things that are very, very alien to them. Um, they see moments when they could exploit this to their advantage, but they don't have the control over the resources or the power to take control of the resources. So there the tensions emerge um, within these transcripts. So maybe I can leave the rest for conversation. Great, thank you so much. Um, Sarah? Yeah. Sure, so I'm gonna give maybe a very brief introduction as to sort of how I came to think about Quebec in line with this, and then maybe preemptively answer the question I usually get when I talk about Quebec in these contexts, which is why are we talking about Quebec in these contexts? Mm -hmm. um, so I, my family's French Canadian, which is part of why I got interested in Quebec. Um, and I started out kind of in historical work looking at French Canadian nationalism and thinking about kind of comparative nationalism. Um, and in, in reading documents from the sort of 60s, which is the, some of the earliest really militant nationalism that emerges in Quebec, it really starts in kind of the World War II post-war moment. Um, I noticed in a lot of the kind of documents I was reading in magazines, publications, speeches, that particularly a generation of sort of young 60s activists who were interested in separatism made references to Fennel, to Memi, to um, 
Jacques Berck, if you know him, is a little bit more of an indie decolonization figure. Um, so all these people that are unusual, right? So one of the most famous documents from the 60s uh, separatist movement in Quebec is this book called The White N Words of America that is talking about how actually French Canadians in Quebec are like basically the same as enslaved African Americans in the US. And obviously you should approach that with a lot of skepticism, but it's an confusing and kind of paradoxical thing that's happening here. Um, so it's, it's one of the things that got me interested in thinking about one, Quebec history, but Quebec history as part of a global movement, right? How are they integrating themselves into part of broader anti-colonial conversations and global conversations about revolution and about decolonization in the 60s and 70s in particular? Um, so to sort of give a little bit of information as to how this is happening, um, there are kind of two levels as to in at which we can talk about decolonization in Quebec and colonialism in Canada in general. Um, at a perhaps more self-evident level, Canada is quite a settler colonial state, so there's that kind of basic, probably what you think of more if you think about colonialism in Canada, right? So you have French Canadians who arrive on Abinaki land in 1608 and settle uh, Quebec City and sort of develop a colony there for 100, 150 years. Um, and are obviously acting as a colonial space. We sort of know that to be true. And then after the Seven Years' War, the British take over French Canada, become um, sort of the de facto political rulers there, give some interesting concessions to French Canadians. They're a little more willing to give them space. They mostly don't want to bother with them a lot of the time. They don't want to have to deal with managing French Canadians. They don't want to have to send a lot of settlers there for the first sort of 50 years of their colonization. Um, fun fact, Quebec is actually the first place in the British Empire where Catholicism is allowed long before um, basically any other colonial space in the British Empire. So there's some concessions that are happening here, but basically from the moment of British conquest, French Canadians are relegated to a secondary political position, right? So indigenous and First Nations Canadian, First Nation um, people in Canada are still sort of underneath that position, but French Canadians are then politically positioned underneath Anglophone Canadians in sort of a political and economic hierarchy. Um, this is to some degree memorialized as a reason for the 1836-37 Patriot Revolt. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but to some degree language rights and the minoritization of French Canadians in larger Canadian government politics is part of this conversation in the 19th century. And then increasingly, um, sort of through the early 20th century, French Canadians get frustrated, right, at these inequalities, particularly as Canada becomes a wealthier nation, becomes increasingly industrialized, and French Canadians feel like they're sort of left out of political decision making, left out of economic decisions, um, really up through the 1980s. Um, French Canadians make up only about 20% of the, the patrona, um, so the managerial classes of Quebec, so not only of Canada, but of Quebec proper. So it's extremely difficult for French Canadians to sort of get to the highest ranks of economic affairs, of political affairs. And so this is a frustration that is sort of always simmering under the surface when we talk about um, Canadian politics and is still very much under the surface in Canadian politics. Um, and it, that's the sort of level at which French Canadians in the 1960s are starting to think about, you know, what is the political problem we have, right? What is the way we can access resources? What is the way to push back against what they see as 100 years of colonization of themselves by the British? Um, so they largely ignore the problems of First Nations and Indigenous people, particularly in the 60s and the 70s. Um, this is a little less true today, though still to some degree true today. Um, but French Canadian separatists in this era start to think about decolonization as a potentially fruitful framework for justifying independence. Um, so we see uh, radical left groups in particular in the 60s really mobilizing, as I said, this language from Fanon, from Mimi, from these other people. They make active comparisons to Algeria. They make really active comparisons to places like Cuba, even if it's sort of an unusual colonial context. And they're trying to draw on these models of anti-colonialism as a way to justify separatism um, and as a way to sort of put this 
to the fore as a legitimate political move. Um, and I think that's something that we could maybe talk about is decolonization on the one hand is a very literal practical thing, right? It's a political change, it's an economic change, it's a social change. But for French Canadians, it's also sort of this discourse that in the 60s and the 70s has legitimacy on the world stage. Um, so after the October crisis of 1970, in which uh, the members of the Front for the Liberation of Quebec kidnap two government ministers and kill one of them, um, they sort of move away from this really radical discourse and a more sort of traditional, a little more sort of centrist, liberal movement for separatism comes to the fore. Um, in 76, you get the election of the Parti Québécois, who then bring Quebec to a referendum in 1980 and a referendum in 1995 that very nearly but do not lead to separatism. Um, but so there's this kind of moment where decolonization is the framework through which they're thinking about this. Um, I think it's both telling that it's a useful tool for them in one moment, and also telling that they're totally willing to drop this when it feels like it's not legitimate. Um, and I think that's yeah maybe one one way to think about decolonization, right? Is um, or even yeah it's one way to think about it insofar as decolonization can be literal, but can also be. I know, uh, against the notable article metaphorical for at least this population. Um, but I think it's also telling that the metaphor is not maybe as necessary for them, right? It's a tool that is useful in a moment and a tool that can be abandoned when it's no longer necessarily as practical. Um, that being said, I do think that trying to understand why this language is useful for them, trying to understand what kinds of international connections French Canadian separatists are trying to make and why those connections feel valuable in the moment. And they're actually quite effective at making these connections. Um, actually, after the, the White N-Words of America book comes out, the author and his sort of close associate get arrested and Stokely Carmichael sends them a telegram saying, we're with you, we understand you, you know, you are our brothers in this, like totally kind of accepting this language, at least for a brief moment. So they're not delegitimized, right? They're at least for a period accepted in using this language. Um, so I think thinking about, again, why this is useful as a tool, and also what ways in which they're mobilizing this language around issues of linguistic nationalism, around cultural nationalism, um, and how they're sort of using this in order to connect with other people and create um, kind of international communities around decolonization can be useful in thinking about how decolonization is operating and how decolonization is um, creating alternate communities, right? And alternate ways of organizing on the world stage. Um, so to some degree, the more radical discourse of decolonization in Quebec in the 60s and 70s is at the heart of uh, la francophonie and Quebec's push to really become central to la francophonie and represent themselves in the international organization of la francophonie and not allowing sort of the federal government to represent them instead. Mm -hmm. So it does really impact sort of who they're communicating with and how they're positioning themselves on the world stage as well, which I think can be kind of interesting to think mm -hmm. about. Um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's my brief introduction to Quebec studies for those who don't know about it. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah. Oh, there's Sarah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I'm going to give pretty brief remarks, um, partly because I am a bad organizer who didn't come <laughs> with an organized set of remarks um, on this topic. Um, let me briefly kind of sketch out what my book is about, what my research is about, and then I'm going to articulate kind of the three ways that I've discovered over 10 years that my work dialogues with decolonization and it's kind of going to be a genealogy um, which I always find pretty interesting learning about how other people uh, win out their topics. So um, I continually have been interested over the course of this 10-year research um, on the antiquity service for the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon. That was always kind of like the central pole of my interest. Um, I remember how I came to the topic, you know, one of those archival eureka moments. Um, I was in La Courneuve in 2012, spending a summer trying to figure out what the heck I was going to write my dissertation on, knowing I was interested in archaeology and French foreign relations and finding this archival folder um, from the antiquity service of the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon that was just uh, from 1930 really rich full uh, and perplexing. I didn't really know much about the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon. Um, I was confused about why they were putting so much 
you know, initially confused about why there was so much money being put into these excavations and also surprised that they were, you know, there was really kind of conspiratorial language basically, you know, we haven't had access to this region for decades and now we do and I didn't know anything about it so I was very intrigued. Um, so, you know, if there's any kind of one keystone of this, the, the book and the research, it's the Antiquities Service for the French Mandate for Syria and Lebanon. Um, and now I want to kind of tell you the genealogy of how I became uh, really convinced that this has a lot to say about decolonization. Um, first, I was interested at the same time as I was interested in the antiquities kind of regime in the mandates. Um, I think I'd read Susan Peterson's articles um, before I went to grad school. Um, in 2008, she came out with um, it's either 2000 or 2000, 2007, 2008, Back to the League of Nations is, a, is you know, HR um, kind of blockbuster review essay. And then in a German journal, The Mandate's an Argument. And I can't remember the German um, journal's title. But um, I read both of those and was really um, kind of stimulated by this uh, it, what seemed to me initially, you know, as a first year grad student, is this kind of intermediate period mandates. I was really intrigued by internationalism and how it um, toggled with colonialism. Um, so that was, you know, one of the reasons I was drawn to this topic. Um, and that's kind of where I started it. I was, I, I wanted to figure out how really what kind of the internationalist rhetoric of these archaeologists, what it was about, um, and how it was being used, you know, I was kind of hypo hypothesizing as a mask for continued colonialism, um, which I think to a certain extent is a valid analysis. Um, over time though, I became more interested in, um, you know, is this a decolonial project? Um, is this a project about decolonization? And I even remember, you know, I had friends somewhere in the audience who were um, doing the decolonization seminar that the National Council, um, National Center for History put on. Is that what it's called, Jess? National History Center. Um, and I remember, you know, being encouraged by friends in the audience um, to consider applying. And I remember kind of saying, well, my project isn't really about decolonization. It's really about anti-colonialism in Syria and Lebanon. And um, archaeology is, you know, was clearly one kind of venue of politics, um, of contestation over sovereignty um, and also over you know material culture and narratives about national identity um, so I didn't apply and I was really invested in understanding you know anti-colonialism um, and then over time um, as I began really writing the book um, writing the dissertation and then the book I realized you know this definitely um, has a lot to contribute, I think, to the um, discussion, you know, the really rich discussion in um, French historiography about decolonization, about post-colonialism, um, where I've kind of ended up, and I'm happy to go deeper in discussion, and this is super uh, superficial, um, where I've ended up with the book is, is, you know, not just kind of using the antiquity service as a lens to study the mandates and anti-colonialism um, and decolonization, but also kind of the beginnings of post-colonial moments. And in my case, in the mandate, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I finished my book in 1948, which is clearly, you know, before, the, a date before most um, kind of con currently conventional periodizations of decolonization. Um, and part of the way I, you know, make arguments about these kind of early moments of post-colonialism um, has to do with like how I've constructed my argument. And really, I finished with the Louvre and how the Louvre is rebranded in 1948 um, as by certain curators and the director of the Louvre as a repository of Western civilization. I'm quoting them. <laughs> um, and there's, you know, really interesting arguments they make um, that uh, kind of have to do with this immediate post-war moment um, of repackaging uh, France as more of a European, Mediterranean, Western um, country in the Louvre. Um, and I think, you know, clearly that has a lot um, to say about Orientalism and also the early moments of decolonization. Um, so I'll just stop there. Like I said, I apologize for not being as um, 
uh, eloquent and organized as my co-panelists. Um, Talk it over to you. Okay, I guess I'll do this too. Um, thank you, everyone. This is really fascinating. Um, I see a lot of connections here, which you know is really interesting to me. And one of the reasons I wanted to even do this um, because I, you know, for years of doing little French India panels that one person came to, um, you know, although at the South Asia conference they're more heavily attended, but. Um, you know, it's like, okay, well, so how do we make connections, um, uh, you know, across these themes and make these global connections that are actually happening on the ground in a lot of ways. You know, I work um, with a contemporary novelist uh, who's Pondicherian, uh, Ari Gautier, who's born in Madagascar. Um, so definitely read his books, everyone should. They're in French um, about Pondicherry. Um, but, you know, these people are, you know, my, my real interest is centering colonial co colonial voices, colonized subjects, and you know, for me, um, the question really has been on this journey of studying French India has really been how do you determine who or what is French, right? Because obviously we have laws. So there's a legal realm in which this is determined, but of course that's not always practically understood. Um, you have linguistic uh, markers, but you know there are 12-ish thousand um, French citizens in Pondicherry today who are of Indian origin who have never gone to France, right? Um, and you know they to, today people are still applying for the citizenship. You know, um, there's a lycée uh, française there. There is an alliance. Like people are going, they're doing um, degrees, they're doing all these things. And you know, for me, for and this is certainly not unique to French India, um, common throughout the colonies. You know, people were citizens early, right? So for you know, if when you when you take a geographic space like South Asia, which was so heavily dominated by the British, but not completely, right? And this is something that South Asian studies is having to deal with right now, is they have really given so much to the British <laughs> that, um, you know, the princely states have been understudied. Um, there's, of course, uh, the uh, Goa, the Portuguese, too. Um, so that's starting to change on that side of um, things, too. Um, but it's really interesting to take a place that has dominated the field of post-colonial studies, Anglophone post-colonial studies, and say, oh, there's these other places too that aren't, that, you know, people, people were citizens beginning in the 1880s. Nobody was a British citizen. In England, they weren't citizens, right? So this is actually like incredibly important to the people who live in the French territories in India. Um, very briefly, there are five of them. <laughs> um, there's a map in this book if anyone wants to look, but uh, they are Chandanagar, which is up by Calcutta. Pondicherry is the main one that's south of Chennai, uh, formerly Madras. Karakal is right south of there, about uh, 50 kilometers. Um, so those two are in Tamil-speaking land. Chandranagar is Bengali. Um, Mahe is in Kerala. Mahe, birthplace of M. Night Shyamalan. There's a fun fact for you, everyone. Um, and Yanam, which is on Andhra Pradesh. Right? These are geographically disparate. They're linguistically um, uh, disparate. And all except Chandranagar, and, and long story, but they voted, um, they had a referendum there, voted to join India in 1949. The rest never had a referendum, which was required under the uh, um, Constitution of the French Fourth Republic. The others never had one. So those four territories are today administered federally as the Union Territory of Pondicherry. And they have all of these kind of fractured, bizarre borders that were negotiations between the British and the French. Right? So, um, so you have this legacy that is still geographically being lived out by people, um, geographically, legally, because of the citizenship, right? Um, people linguistically, um, you know, a lot of this is maintained through tur tourism today. Um, uh, Air France is the only airline that flies direct from Europe to Chennai. Right, and it's because people are going to Pondicherry, <laughs> um, right? So this is this. There, there's all kinds of things. I take this up um, in the book, and and also the question of um, you know people who are not state actors um, but are related to the French state. So I look at the story. I don't know if people um, know about Oroville, but it's an intentional community, heavily populated by French 
um, people in um, right outside of Pondicherry. Um, and uh, w the founder of it is this woman named Mira Alfasa, who is a French woman uh, born um, in 1870, 1871 um, in France to uh, Sephardic Jewish parents who were from Turkey and Egypt, um, interestingly. Um, and, and she, you know, she's not, she's, her husband, when she goes to Fran or when she goes to Pondicherry, uh, Paul Richard, he works for uh, the, fr he works for the Colonial Service, right? He is sent there, but they go because they're really into the occult. Um, they're into theosophy, they're into mysticism, and they want to meet this guy, Sri Aurobindo, who's in exile, um, who has sought refuge in Pondicherry from the British, mm. right? So th that's where they arrive there. And there today, um, Oroville, and then that ashram that the mother, uh, Mira Fossa becomes known as the mother, that Orbinda and Alfasa had, like they are the biggest draws to that area. They're a global tourist destination, but also within India. So you have this woman who's this French woman who has become, a, you know, she's a, she's one of the people that people worship in India, right? She's on people's walls. There's the mother's schools all over India, right? Um, and she comes up as a part of the colonial project, um, you know. So I, I um, talk about um, this idea, which I call anti anti-colonial colonialism <laughs> because while she sort of espouses an anti-colonialism, maybe this is similar to the Quebecois, um, you know, she, she says she's apolitical, there's like no politics in the ashram, yet they own all the property in what is called uh, the white town um, of Pondicherry, right? They're the only people that have a car in Pondicherry, <laughs> things like this. They still own all the property in, in the nicest parts of town, um, which were racially segregated. So uh, I, I, you know, I, in in terms of decolonization, what I really think about is this tension between uh, minor, what is minor, what is marginal, and what is, um, you know, for lack of a better term, sort of major, or what dominates our understanding of things. From Anglophone South Asia um, to just the fields of post-colonial studies, which, you know, I think there's a lot for us to think about in how um, French studies has or has not um, thought about post-colonialism, and what sort of looking at different linguistic um, uh, uh, registers can tell us about the histories of these places. Decolonization in French India doesn't happen until 1962 with the Avian Accords. Mm. Right? The British are gone in 1947. The French agree to leave after they lose um, Indochina in 1954, and they won't ratify it until they've lost Algeria. So they're hanging on to it until they finally um, let go. And you have French bureaucrats today um, making statements like, we shouldn't call what we did in India colonialism because it was so friendly. Mm. And a lot of people in India sort of agree with that because the British was, were so bad, <laughs> right? But there, of course, the French are so bad in other places. So it is this, you know, there's this constant interaction going on. Um, and you know, one of my, uh, one of my arguments is that it hasn't, that hasn't stopped. You know, a lot of those borders still exist. A lot of the sort of practices of everyday life exist there. Um, so for me, it was sort of a question of, well, I'm gonna center the people who are French Indians in these territories because they consider themselves French. Right when they migrate, um, and I have a chapter on when they migrate to France, many of them after 1954, they they lose a lot of that Frenchness because people don't see them as French anymore. A lot of them had served in the wars, right? And um, they were on pensions. Um, but then you you had people also joining the military when they moved there because they don't have any money, <laughs> um, and they um, sort of you know it's like who are you? What is this? Um, um, sort of interaction. So, uh, so there's a lot of complications around there. But we have to sort of we have to think about all of these different um, these different re uh, national registers working sort of on each other. Because after 47, there's an India, right? But those the British Indian borders just become Indian borders. The British Indian laws become Indian laws, and then they're battling the French. Now it's India versus French India versus British India <laughs> instead of British India versus French India. You know, so. Um, and so there's something to be to be said about there. So, so last thing I'll say on that before we open it up more widely is for me, decolonization is, as people have been talking about it, 
a bureaucratic formal process, but it's also um, you know one where we think about epistemology. It's one where we think about how we understand categories, right? Um, you know, it, it, and, it, and I think those things. I'm like at part just a materialist, right? I'm just <laughs> um, like what happened, um, and these institutions don't change a lot of the time, and so a lot of times they're not even state institutions, right? I mean, we can look at funding, and you know, the French continues to fund a lot of those institutes in um, in Pondicherry today, but um, you know, informal eco economy um, things um, that are going on too, and just sort of the the, the barriers and the uh, the alleyways that are opened for people and closed. Who can go where? Why? And these things are. Um, are all sort of based on, on there. So to write a history of decolonization, I also wanted to think about what it meant to think, you know, I don't, I don't um, you, uh, Sarah referred to Tuckin Yang's decolonization is not a metaphor, and I'm not suggesting we're gonna sit here and decolonize <laughs> history, because it actually is about land back to me, um, and that is true in the case of Oroville, <laughs> give the land back. Um, but uh, but I, I do think we need to think about what it means to understand the history of a place through the language of imperialism, and that's true for the French and the English, right? And through the lens of their, um, you know, their categorizations of who people are. Um, so it's it, they're just questions I take up in there, um, and ones um, I think that we should all sort of think about when we're doing this. And why is it so hard um, to decenter the state? Why is it so hard to do that in these? You know, and I think we wanted to talk about institutional barriers, so that mm -hmm. that might be part of the reason um, but I am one person with one project so I would love to hear um, from other people on this too so thank you maybe I'll also say that um, so one of our intentions for the panel today was to um, for it not to be feel like a panel <laughs> for it to feel like a round table um, and so it's it's five o'clock right now which means you know we have 45 minutes um, left if we choose it um, Maybe um, I have questions from my co-panelists, and I know Jekka does too, but maybe we could at this point see if anyone in the audience has questions or uh, comments. Um, we are hoping that we would learn from your ex potential experiences yeah. as much as you know we would from being at here together. Yeah, and because this is being recorded, there is a microphone that will go around um, to go on the society's web page. I believe that's where it's going. Um, but I, just to echo Sarah, I mean, I think we would all love to hear if people have experiences or you know, in um, encountered roadblocks or even just you know what it might mean to bring some of these kinds of histories into a classroom, right, where these things aren't usually taught because there's no space for it. You know, I mean. There's only certain so much French history you can teach, mm -hmm. in especially in the Western Academy. So, or sorry, the American Academy. If nobody's re uh, ha is ready at this point, not a problem. That looks yeah. like Jeff's mic. Right, microphone. Yeah, yeah. Be kind <laughs> to the microphone runner, please. Does this work? It, yeah, it's it going go into the room. It only goes through the recording. Oh, okay, cool. This that actually makes me less nervous. Great. <laughs> um, thank you all for such wonderful um, presentations. And, and it's interesting that you ended with this question of like, how do we bring this into the classroom? Um, my students in my decolonization class read Jekka's book, and mm -hmm. she came and gave a wonderful visit to my class and convinced one of my students to become a history major. Um, so I, I think there is space in the classroom. Uh, I have so many thoughts, I don't even know where to start or if I can read my writing, um, but I'll just pick one. Um, connected to this question of like the Tuck and Yang article and decolonization not being a metaphor and it being about land back, um, I'm curious how you all see these conversations unfolding at your institutions. Um, I think that in some ways the sort of ubiquity of the term decolonization has resulted in the marginalization of the actual histories of decolonization historically, um, globally being taught. And so I would be curious to hear from you all or from other folks in the audience how you see those two things potentially coming together at your institutions and um, what role can we play as historians? of decolonization and helping inform some of these conversations and bringing it back to, <clears throat> you know, 
actual decolonization land back. Um, and then I guess maybe a similar, in a similar vein, you know, having been part of these conversations here and at the decolonization seminar over the years, I think that the sort of collective narrative that we've come up with is the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, and something I'm trying to really think about as I'm working on my new project about decolonizing tourism, and I'm trying not to use it metaphorically, um, slash touring decolonization is, um, I'm curious, like, the narrative that sovereignty matters, mm -hmm. has that been pushed to the margins of the history that we are all collectively writing? Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to respond to a start. I'd love to hear from everybody, but um, as Jess knows, I also teach a decolonization class. And, and you know, I'm not, I am teach in sort of a global studies program, so I have um, quite a bit of flexibility with what I can do in there, not that you don't, but, um, but so I, I split up my course um, into uh, the theories of decolonization, histories of decolonization, and like contemporary movements for decolonization to give students a sense of all these different registers. But you know, I'm also at Duke, like home of decolonial studies too, sort of, anyway. Um, so there's like a lot of that <laughs> going around, um, which is productive, but you know, it's, it's, it's because um, it's really, it's a word that is in the zeitgeist. Um, you know, people use it in all kinds of different ways. So, I mean, I think my biggest concern, so you know, I get 16 students a time at a seminar, right? So there's only so much you can do in there. Um, so I mean, I, I think a few things. One, one thing is I think we need to push institutions to do more, that my course always um, engages Duke itself. So we always look at the history of Duke as a settler institution. We go into the archives. Duke was once um, the home of a Cherokee industrial school. We look at those records. Um, we talk about gentrification in Durham today, right? Um, so we do that kind of work where I always center where they are mm -hmm. um, and encourage them to think about that um, in terms of where they're coming from. But we need to also push um, universities to be doing institutional history in a critical way, right? Um, and you know, I know some people who have been successful um, with this by sort of telling their administration it's coming for you, <laughs> like get out ahead of it and hire somebody who's doing this historical work, right? Um, to really understand all of all of education's role in this. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I think the thing that people, and especially those of us who um, get targeted as scholars of color <laughs> and have to serve on diversity committees all the time, like DEI initiatives are not decolonization. Do not get that word out of your mouth um, is what you should say to them, I think. <laughs> but, um, but, you, but you're so right. You know, I'm, I, I have a colleague who uh, does, um, Sam, Sam uh, Childs, who, um, Fury Childs, who does, uh, decolonization in um, Nigeria and we have this conversation all the time like there is also a thing called decolonization right um, so I think I think people just need to be teaching it more you know in the history classroom like everybody should be teaching it in their history classrooms I think yeah. sorry I thought about this a lot <laughs> do either of you want to uh, I mean, my institution cannot be further from <laughs> Duke. Wow. Um, we lost our history requirement oh. last semester. I uh, was this going forward. Oh. Um, so lots of challenges in studying, in teaching even history period. So I'm not even going to go into what colonial and decolonization teaching is going to look like. But I will speak to the research part of this because my research is still supported by the school. And I come from settler colonial studies. Um, that's my actual research field. And um, yes, it's important to recognize and outwardly express uh, the, the real history that we're living. Um, but maybe we can draw an analogy with slavery. Um, slavery as an institution has ended. But if we talk to those who are descendants of slaves, how they feel about what has ended is going to be very different from uh, how we understand the institutional framework and its demise. And I could, we could say that about colonialism and decolonization. There's definitely was a sea change. Um, everyone has lots of literature and historical evidence point to the fact that sovereignty was acquired, fought for, and gained. 
Um, and in that context, however, there are many continuities. I'm seeing in the audience um, uh, researchers whose panels I went to, and every one of them spoke to the continuities uh, of colonial uh, control that um, still went on in different forms. So in speaking about those continuities doesn't take away from the fact that we recognize that sovereignty was achieved and those coexist, right? And that's the very problematic. Why do they coexist despite the institutional demise is the real question uh, we're asking. In the um, Madagascan case, what's interesting is that these peasants, in some villages, they're very much, you know, they don't want to even see the French. In some villages, they're very intrigued and interested in what these sociologists and development uh, operations can do for them. They're not that interested in producing for the market economy, but they are interested in, say, what to do when there's a famine. Uh, so very practical things, if those can be resolved through aid from these kinds of operations, they're not entirely opposed to it. So again, even within one country, as the French appear, uh, uh, even with their very anti-colonial intentions, the response is very different and it's not always political. Sometimes it's very practical from the perspective of those needing things. Uh, on the other hand, what I found really intriguing about this case is, you know, how do we understand the, the global phenomenon of modernization that went in hand with, with decolonization? Because there are layers of this, right? There's decolonization, there's development, there's modernization, and all of these are getting intertwined, and they're starting to have an impact on the daily lives of those uh, that uh, are affected by these changes. So one of the responses um, I could give is that actually I talked a lot about sort of how the Madagascans upend and subvert the narrative that's coming at them from development, but in the end the French do something that is very um, uh, radical, which is that as they're selecting these animators in each village, they're finding again and again that they're ending up uh, selecting, or the village ends up selecting and designating the youngest people who don't actually have in traditional customary structures any authority. So what's happening is that they're changing the, the social relationships and hierarchies embedded in the villages. And in the end, the elders just say, you know, you do it because no one else wants to do it. But when they come back from training, they have certificates, they have formal papers that actually they feel now they can use to impose instructions on their fellow villagers and even on the elders. And the French use that um, uh, opportunity to give them even more empowerment to do things in the village and, and you see later in the villages in the late 60s where the relationships have been completely altered between the elders and the youth so that kind of thing tells us that you know modernization is not one uniform thing decolonization is not one uniform thing but you have to really get on the ground and look at the reception of this to um, see how decolonization works or how modernization works mm -hmm. and to trace a discourse first is really important and I think um, I don't have the linguistic skills I just was very happy to find that it was all transcribed mm -hmm. so these are very lucky cases of archival work but um, yeah I mean I think the limitation is that if we look at the French side it just looks like one phenomenon yeah. 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 yeah and I wonder so um, I'm not very, I'm down the road from Jekka at UNC. Um, UNC operates quite differently from Duke in terms of what they do and do not do. Mm -hmm. um, there are some graduate students doing really, really great work on land back in particular and trying to really push the university administration um, to both recognize but take active measures um, to, yeah, both sort of acknowledge and work towards uh, acting on some of these these issues. Um, I think one thing I might add on the question of sovereignty that's interesting that I think Quebec makes for a really odd case and if anybody knows things about Canadian studies you probably know that Anglophone scholarship and Francophone scholarship are really, really separated. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of conversation between those two fields in Quebec. There, most Anglophone um, Canadian historians do like a minor field in Quebec history as like the separate, totally unrelated thing that just happens to exist over there. 
But I think it's interesting um, in relation to this question of sovereignty because there's a sort of continued perception on the part of French Canadians, in particular Quebecers, um, that this, the failure to achieve sovereignty means that there's a need to continue prioritizing their own struggle, um, which I think in some ways is legitimate, right? We have um, increasing minoritization of the French language in other places in Canada. Um, still, Anglophone Canadians in Quebec are disproportionately likely to not be bilingual and disproportionately likely to not sort of participate in Francophone life. So those are real problems that exist. On the other hand, that sort of concentration on sovereignty on the part of French Canadians means that they do totally marginalize the question of real decolonization, right? The question of real land back movements um, are very willing to ignore the ways in which they also, you know, particularly now that French Canadians are mostly sort of dominant in provincial politics, the ways in which they also operate as a settler colonial state, right? That they are also putting down um, uh, indigenous and First Nations peoples when they're pushing back against the state in things like the Oka crisis that was really sort of attempting to reclaim land from development companies in Quebec. The French Canadian prime minister of the province, no patience for this, right? Sent in the military, was wholly unwilling to listen to um, this narrative of sovereignty and of practical requests for land and power um, by First Nations and indigenous people. So I think it's interesting to think about Quebec as a space where there are these sort of multiple claims of sovereignty and of rights to sovereignty. Um, and the quote unquote failed attempt of one, but one that has then brought French Canadians to significantly more power than they used to have, has then led to them behaving as perhaps the Anglophone government used to over First Nations and Indigenous people in Canada um, through institutions like universities, but also through the government. Um, yes, yeah, so it's kind of an interesting way to think about how this, this question of sovereignty operates practically as well. I think I'm just going to add one thing on there that's really fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, in my reading of largely um, post-independence Indian history, but other areas too, and then of course all the, the not all the French literature, but a <laughs> lot of it, um, you know, look, part of the problem, especially in the India case, is that the way that post-47 Indian history has been written was really a project of nation making, even by the most progressive mm -hmm. of, and I heard, um, to the very important uh, feminist historian, Romilla Tharper, talking about this recently, like they all went through JNU in the 1960s, right? And it really was about contributing. So, so it's that even if it's not a glorification of what was happening, there is such an emphasis in the importance of the sovereignty, right? That you, there has been a failure up to this point to really take and to consideration what the failures right. of the sovereignty have looked like. Right, right. Right, and so it's, you know, I mean, you see this in India now, and, you know, a lot of European states are doing this too. I mean, against the, in France, the pushback against teaching colonialism, same in England, right? Um, that, you know, it's, um, we don't want to talk about the bad things, right? So you get, uh, you know, the, a push to, teach a glorif like where sovereignty is the mm -hmm. ultimate goal and if you have sovereignty everyone's okay right. and then it's the market <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. Um, so it, it it's it's something that i think we all need to be pushing back against and when you're doing this kind of work on decolonization you have to take up multiple historiographies right yeah. because you're they're kind of battling each other mm -hmm. in terms of just the the practicalness of what they're teaching in their schools and, and popular attitudes, and I'm sure that's that's true for Quebec, right? Yeah, 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 and it has been really interesting being trained academically fully outside of Canada. Yeah, and then I'm, you know, we recently have a member of, on my committee who is, you know, at a Canadian university. I've participated in sort of academic life there, and like Anglophone conferences in Canada are just wholly different universes than Francophone mm. conferences yeah. in Canada. They mostly don't talk to each other. Um, they're doing totally different things and both doing good work in interesting ways, but yeah, sort of watching the academy happen over there and thinking from a different perspective about why these debates are what they are. Yeah. 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 Are there any other questions from the audience before we ask questions? Yeah. Liz, behind. We have 20 minutes left. Hi, thanks so much. Oh, it's I, not gonna come oh great. <laughs> Sorry. We might Still need you to talk loud. Oh, thank you so much for this fascinating panel. Sorry, always bad at judging my voice. Uh, really thought provoking, and it's been fascinating to hear this conversation. And I was thinking, 
I, I had kind of something to propose and then something to ask. One thing about your title and the way you frame it, right, decolonization at the margins, it seemed to me one thing it really invites is sort of like the flip, which is decolonization a, a little bit more comparatively. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're part of a really, what to me seems salutary move in our field, broadly speaking, of moving away from, you know, a colony metropole side of things and thinking in a lot more different contexts, right? Jacka, your work, right, thinking about the not just implicit, but like very constantly omnipresent comparison to British colonialism. Uh, Sarah thinking about right, what do we mean by colonialism and where do we put the mandates and these different visions of sovereignty, the layers of can right, you go down, I think all of you have a different framework for that in certain ways. And I think the other question I would pose is how much um, kind of a theme coming out of the Q&A is about the kind of memory politics mm -hmm. of decolonization. Yep. So it seems to me that, um, Sarah, what you're talking about, about, you know, you're talking about, on the other hand, waves of politics in Canada, mm -hmm. but also whether or not we can start talking about the kinds of paradigms I feel like people have in other fields, you know, thinking about World War II or other things about the kind of generational memory and whether in decolonization we could start you know, charting things out in those lines as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in there. Um, thanks so much. And I'll, I'll say just briefly that um, on the question about the memory politics of decolonization um, and maybe particularly the kind of embedded comparison that um, when I approach that question, I bring to it. Um, one of the... Um, I think it comes into my book as an argument, but it's also kind of one of the guiding questions that I had as I went about the project was, um, you know, as I said, when I found in the archive this um, rich file about archaeology in Syria and Lebanon, and I realized, you know, I knew that it had been part of the French kind of colonial sprawl at one point, but I, in fact, knew very, very little about it. and couldn't really find, um, you know, there were certainly books that were written either by French historians who then went, became Middle East historians, um, you know, within a, a, that field, um, and, or, you know, were, um, there were some that were kind of, you know, written by French historians that I thought did speak to French empire, like I'm thinking of Martin Thomas's work, um, but there wasn't that much, and I just realized that not only was, did it seem um, sparse in the historiography in the French frame, but also in, in French memory. Um, I really, you know, I went, when I lived in Paris for a year at the ONS, I would walk every day past um, a Maronite Lebanese church that was close by. Um, beyond that, I didn't really see, you know, much kind of, of physical evidence in France um, of the mandate. Um, I did see it in the Louvre, and so that was, you know, kind of where, you know, my original eureka moment in the archive, you know, keeps me focused on looking at the Louvre and then looking at museum sites. Um, but in terms of kind of, you know, large, um, you know, commemorative politics with events um, or with our debates about laws, um, I don't really see the mandate for Syria and Lebanon. Um, fitting in, in the, at the same level of kind of, you know, obviously Algeria is probably, you know, the most obvious um, case. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something that uh, has focused my work in multiple registers. Um, and I will also say, you know, I think population, like, numbers matter. There, the the post-mandate migration um, from Syria and Lebanon was very small. Um, a lot of the Lebanese community in you know, France um, and probably Syrian community now comes from the 1970s, 80s civil war and then post 2011. Um, but yeah, it's really fascinating. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about memory politics or comparative decolonizations, which is also a great question. <laughs> Um, so, uh, again, I guess I can only speak to, uh, my mind is just on Madagascar. <laughs> um, 
I remember going to the panels from some of the audience members and thinking uh, decolonization is really uh, a lot about memory also and lived memories of people who are either immigrants from the former colonies at, or tourism or UNESCO and all of these institutions work around how to re-commemorate the colonial past. In this case, um, there was something very specific uh, that was striking in Madagascar, which was that the French had, um, since Gallieni in Madagascar, used a certain village uh, system, a council called the Fokonolona, and there's two of them, Fanja Kanana and Fokonolona, and um, they were actually local councils uh, that were segregated in one part of the island. But the French decided it was a great system to use those councils to mediate authority down to the um, village level, so they actually created Fokonolonas across the entire island and so villages that never really had them were uh, now instituted with those and they were mainly used to collect uh, corvées taxes and so the Madagascans always associated these councils with forced labor and taxation so once independence happened and the sociologists arrive and they're still communicating through the or these councils the peasants uh, immediately have this knee-jerk reaction that that's bad because anything that's coming from the French through these councils had to do with imposing uh, burdens. So that memory um, stayed with them even though it, their work had nothing to do with taxation. So on the ground from the perspective of the colonized, formerly colonized, um, memory works in that way, that it triggers this, these uh, reactions and sentiments and responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I was thinking about with memory politics, maybe in relation to this question of institutions as well, um, is in going to some, some French Canadian conferences, you know, one of the things that's really striking, and this is true to some degree for other, I think, post-colonial spaces, is this kind of perception of fragility of national identity, right, and national history, and the need to protect, like, protect national history, and that it's sort of being misrepresented. It's this recent thing, and they're sort of only, in the last X number of years, able to tell it the way they want to tell it, which then becomes this perception of fragility. But I think where I see this as being linked to the question of institutions and sort of what we do as academics is if when we leave things on the margins, right, it contributes to some degree, not that it's the fault of, but it contributes to some degree to this perception of fragility. Um, so the idea that Quebec memory politics are fragile is partially about, you know, white fragility and partially about ethno-linguistic identity and all these other complex things, but it's also this perception that Anglophone Canadians have never actually recognized the kind of vindication or the kind of uh, but the, the kind of critiques that French, French Canadians have made of them. And they're not included in Anglophone conferences. And they're not, you know, whenever I talk about the, the work I do in Quebec, the question is, what's happening here, right? Like, what is this? I didn't know there was a separatist movement. Some people do, but yeah, it's a pretty marginal field. So I think for a lot of these places sort of on the margins, there's this feeling that as long as it is on the margins academically, you have to stay in this really defensive posture, yeah, yeah. which then has a pretty significant impact on, on how that story is told as well. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah, I mean, I'll just maybe, I don't want to dominate this. Um, but this is a great question about the memory politics, but I think it is a time, it's a temporal issue. I mean, and, and just institutionally, you know, it's like, well, I finished, I, my dissertation was done in 2012, um, and my decolonization archives in X didn't open until 2014, right? So I went back and got so much more <laughs> that I didn't have. So part of it is institutional. They just weren't open yet, right? We're not that far out. But it's such an, I mean, I think for all of us, it's such an important history to be talking about just for this, like, there was actually decolonization. But it is still a question, and people are still alive, obviously, right? We're still getting papers. Um, there is this, you know, as we've seen over the past 
10 plus years, nationalism just keeps getting stronger. <laughs> you know, all of the 1990s posturing about is globalization the end of the nation state was certainly wrong, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, I think that that is just the political reality that we live in. So people trying to work through how decolonization is being told, you know, I mean, and I, I also think the nationalist histories in that sense, and I'll just, I'm just speaking from India here um, exclusively, right, is that um, the national, the, the need for a national, a Hindu nationalist history is incredibly well supported by the government. It has a huge amount of diasporic money behind it. It comes into textbooks in the United States and Texas and California. Right, so this is a huge, huge topic. Um, and so, you know, what we have then is if people, you know, in India want to do the history of French India, they need to get themselves to France. They need to get themselves to England. They can't do that. Right, so it's the repatriation of records back to the metropole is a problem, mm -hmm. right? Lack of resources for archival, keeping archives is a problem. Everything in the Pondicherry archive is laminated. Um, <laughs> everything? <you know, laughs> uh, maybe not everything, but a lot of things, you know. So anyway, so, you know, there's all kinds of, so if you want to be doing these sort of alternative histories, you really need the funding of, you know, someone in the Western Academy and a passport that gets yeah. you to these places, right? Um, so, and the time. Um, so that that's really feeding into the inability. And like, I haven't tried to touch an Algeria archive. I'm sure that's yeah. much worse, right? Um, so I think all of these like contemporary politics really, really play into how we can understand the history of decolonization. Mm -hmm. Burley. Um, thanks, everybody. It's really, uh, I'm Burley, by the way. Um, really nice to learn about your work um, and, and great panel. And I hope this isn't too diversionary, but I just have been thinking about sort of decolonial and what it means in Latin American studies. Yeah. And I'm still like a novice, but very curious about what they're doing. Yeah. In some ways, I think very far ahead of what our field is doing, but also maybe problematic and doesn't work quite the same way. So it's interesting in this panel about, you know, with decolonial being trotted out left and right, and all of your work being so grounded in, in you know, empirical material evidence, et cetera, that I haven't heard the term like colonial matrix all weekend, <laughs> even though I've been at all these decolonization panels. I've rarely heard the term modernity in a coupling with colonialism, which is also kind of interesting. I just think the discourses are co quite different. And I was just curious if, you know, you guys had any thoughts or reflections on like, are we doing this wrong or, uh, or are we just use, are we doing similar things with different words? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, there's also this question of it, the, the desire for everything to be like indigeneity. It's got to be like a, almost like a dialectical opposition when, you know, a lot of these things coexist and, and you know, are imbricated, etc. So anyway, just a little food for thought. I don't even know if that's a question or not, but um, it's just on the mind. Thank you. Thanks, Farley. So indigeneity, colonial matrix, modernity are what you're hearing in the Latin American circles. Yes, yeah. that's the yeah. language of decolonial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Latin American studies, it's like everywhere. I just listened to a, you know, an African came and gave a talk about the community and was using some language. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do cite Walter in my book, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I think there's a lot to learn from the decolonial approach. Um, as someone, like, I've, I've worked, it's a, it's a pretty big field. I mean, it is, a, you know, in thinking about the, the question of language um, and approaches, you know, I think one thing the decolonial really gives us is a different, um, a different time frame, mm. right? And, and this, you know, I think in, in material terms, something that the decolonization movement of the 1960s really lacked was an engagement with what had happened in Latin America. Of course, there's solidarity around Cuba and Che Guevara, of course, and all of these things are going on. But there's a fundamental understanding that what's going on in Latin America like has to do with the US, right? It's not about these relationships they had had with Spain and Portugal. Um, so I, you know, I think the reframing of 1492, um, the reframing of like, um, you know, the dark side of modernity, all of these things, I, I think gives us a lot of good tools to, to think through, especially the questions of um, development and progress. 
um, and things like that. Um, and also the question um, that I raised without saying the word decolonial, um, but um, of, of just categories, right? And, and how we understand how things work. I mean, I think, um, I don't know, maybe we could talk about decoloniality um, later. You know, this, this, I don't know if you were referencing this, but there was a moment recent, uh, recently where Walter McNeil blurbed a book of a Hindu right nationalist who used the word decolonial in the title. <laughs> And then he's like, oh, sorry, didn't mean it. Um, but, but it's been like, it's a language that's been co-opted, right? Because again, the sovereignty is the ultimate, mm -hmm. is then you have the Hindu right saying, Muslims are invaders. Like we're trying to get sovereign from them. And, and this is a decolonial take on contemporary India. And then you, you know, you have Walter blurbing it. I shouldn't call him out publicly like this probably, <laughs> but he knows. Um, so, so, you know, co-optation is really important there. Um, but, I, but I do like the post-colonialism of Anglophone South Asia, um, you know, histories of colonialism in France, uh, the decolonial, like I, I do wish there was more uh, sort of discussion between them because I think there's tools that can be mm -hmm. taken um, to be useful. Mm -hmm. But for me, that's what's been really good to think through. I mean, for me, that's just a good reminder that I need to, you know, um, especially I think when we get into these work silos of trying to, you know, hit deadlines, you know, you just kind of start paying attention to only your field. And so, you know, the Latin American kind of field is not something that is on my radar right now, but and that's a good reminder, you know, that <laughs> to kind of try to, to make sure that within our field that we're not losing sight of um, discussions that are happening adjacent that might be, you know, enriching. Um, yeah, there was another question. Yeah, we Patricia only have five had a minutes, question. So. Hi, <clears throat> Patricia. Really? And I wanted to actually, um, Burley's question made me think of, of something that I've been kind of considering as we talk about this and how do we, how do we, uh, from a sort of structural and institutional standpoint, how do we how do we advance the field of decolonial studies when you know we're not in conversation with Latin Americas um, when jobs are posted you know for a specific region or a specific country when at my institution my position is transnational historian but um, our classes are are defined are categorized regionally and so when my classes cross regions it's sort of a problem for categorization mm -hmm. um, thinking about grants um, and how those are designed for people to go to one country, maybe yeah. two countries, um, thinking about conferences um, yeah. and thinking about um, training of, of graduate students um, and all of that. So how do we kind of advance, how do we advance the field? How do we challenge the institutions and how do we, mm -hmm. how can we do that and how can we bring about kind of a more advanced study of, of decolonization through these, these restrictions? And I think that gets to a lot of <laughs> questions <laughs> of archives and things like that that you were discussing earlier. That's a great question. I, was, I just want to show you, these are the six questions on our sheet that essentially capture what you asked. So I j said, joked to Jekka, I said, it's like we planted. <laughs> You're a plant. Because, um, yeah, I mean, we wanted to talk about kind of institutional and research capacity questions um, that come with doing decolonization, especially if it's, you know, comparative decolonization or this idea of, you know, on the margins, essentially, you know, from my own experience working, you know, doing research in Lebanon required. Um, networks that I didn't necessarily have through French history and they weren't hard to find thanks to the privilege of being at my institution which was NYU that happened to have a really robust MEIS program so I had plenty of graduate students and professors who could help me but um, it's certainly you know a question that we wanted to try to get to um, and you bring in you know other questions like with you know, teaching. Um, so I'll stop talking and maybe let one of my panelists take that. Any part of your good question up? I feel like I have maybe questions more than I have answers. Um, 
but it's something that I've been thinking about. I have like four conferences in a week, so I've been thinking a lot about conferences and what the purpose of conferences are and like what we're trying to get out of them. And I feel like the entire time I've been in graduate school, I'm just, I'm never certain what I'm supposed to do at a conference. Like, am I, am I proposing a new thing? Am I developing a thing I've already done? Is this like wild ideas and you tell me if this is worth pursuing? Like, I just have I've never fully grasped. I feel like every time I think I know I go to a conference, and it was definitely not that. Um, so I think it's something worth thinking about, right? It's like, what are we doing at conferences? And SFA, I think this is why I really like this panel idea is because it's a way to talk to other people about a concept and see if we can learn from each other and really figure some, I mean, we're not gonna solve problems today. Um, but, you know, we can get ideas and really sort of learn from each other in productive ways. So that's to, I think you're right, to maybe think about conferences and their productivity um, and what we're trying to do with them maybe across regional borders of disciplines and across sort of thematic borders. Um, the one thing I will say for UNC, we actually fully redesigned our graduate program recently, um, and this new incoming cohort, and from now on, we're requiring everybody to have two advisors all the time, and they're basically never from the same field. Um, so you can't just have two of our French historians as your main advisors. They have to be sort of different. So maybe you have one that's your geographic advisor and one that's your thematic advisor. Hmm. So sort of grounding that as like a fundamental principle of how we're doing graduate work and how we're training people, um, which is a, a minor thing to move towards that goal, but I think is an interesting way to think about how we're training people and across sort of methodologies as well as regions. I mean, I think one of the big questions in the decolonial, post-colonial, actual colonialism <laughs> um, debates is like it's there, for me teaching it. You know, there's the register of words people use colloquially, and so students have an understanding of it. Like I, the number of times I have to say like, let's sit down and read some decolonial theorists because that's not what that means, and it's not on them, mm -hmm. right? Like people use these words all the time. So you know, your question, it's it's. I, I think especially if you're really invested in a field, French history, it can be like, how am I gonna go read a bunch of Latin Americanists? Don't I need to learn Spanish first? Like, you know, and it's, um, you know, it takes time, it takes the confidence to, <laughs> to sort of go and do that. But I think it needs to be done. Um, you know, not all of them, but um, but it, we're getting to the point where there's enough decolonial work where I think um, you, can, you can get through it. But it's also, you know, for me, when I first came to it, thinking maybe this would help me think through this sort of bordered, air, strangely bordered area um, in India. Um, it, you know, it was a, I was, there was also disappointments. Like I thought it was gonna do things it definitely doesn't do. And actually they're pretty explicit. Like it's about ontology and epistemology. <laughs> you know, they're not actually very much interested in material issues or actual actual histories and things like this. So I mean, they have a project. Post-colonialism has a project, right? And, and you know, I think there's, there's enough out there now where you can figure out what that project is um, through web webinars and conversations and some um, light reading um, to just sort of think about them in comparison to each other. Um, and, and then, you know, it's not a question of sort of making a toolbox, but of knowing what other people are talking about. And I think, you know, French studies to a certain extent is in a space where it's sort of stayed out of some of these debates in a way, well, I, and rejected some of them, but um, where, you know, it can be a, pl a place to insert and think about it. Like, there's a French presence in all of these parts of the world. What does that mean, mm -hmm. right? Like, how can we think about theory in that sense, right? Um, anyway, that's where I'm at with, with that. But it's a great question. It's a great question from everyone. I think we're out of time. We are at 545. Yeah. Um, thank you. Everyone. Thank you Good so job. much for coming last day, you know, last day, last, <laughs> last panel. Day.